Hello, it's now 2.01 p.m. Eastern Time. I want to thank you all for joining the webinar. To allow for late arrivals, we will be starting the event in a few minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the webinar, Police Mental Health Collaborations, a Framework for Implementing Effective Law Enforcement Response for People Who Have Mental Health Needs. A couple of housekeeping items. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. To ask a question, please type it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We will do our best to answer your questions. If your question does not get answered during the webinar, please follow up via email after the event. At the end of the presentation, we will provide email addresses for everyone speaking today. If you encounter technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. And for this reason, we are recording this event and we'll post it on our website in one to two weeks. We will also provide a PDF of the slides along with the recording. This webinar will begin in approximately one minute. Welcome everyone. My name is Terry Lynn and I'm the Deputy Director of Law Enforcement on our behavioral health here at the Council of State Government's Justice Center. I'm the former Dean of Criminal Justice, as well as Senior Administrator and Faculty Member at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I've spent the past 21 years in higher education. I am a former police officer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as well as the State of New Hampshire, and a DEA Task Force Agent with the New England Field Division. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I am also licensed and certified as a police mental health instructor in the State of New York, and I also oversaw the psychological training at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the Emergency Psychiatric Technician Program for the NYPD's Hostage Negotiation Team and Emergency Service Unit. Joining us on this call today, we have Maria Fryer, Justice System and Corrections Policy Advisor for Substance Abuse and Mental Health, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the U.S. Department of Justice. Maria Fryer is a Policy Advisor for the U.S. Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, where she oversees the justice and behavioral health portfolio and collaborates with the CSG Justice Center to assist states, local government, and behavioral health organizations to better understand the relationships between the criminal justice and mental health populations and to help create policy and programming that meets the needs of municipalities and the citizens they serve. On this call as well, Sergeant Sauer Shimko from the Madison Police Department Sergeant Shimko has served as a law enforcement officer for the Madison Police Department for 14 years and currently supervises MPD's mental health unit. Sergeant Shimko currently serves as a law enforcement mental health learning site representative, a member of the Dane County Criminal Justice Council's Behavioral Health Subcommittee, the Data Driven Justice Familiar Faces Work Group, the Collaborative Stabilization Coalition of Dane County, the Wisconsin CIT Advisory Committee, and coordinates MPD's crisis intervention management training. Joining us from Tucson, Sergeant Jason Winsky, who oversees the mental health support team. Sergeant Winsky has served at the Tucson Police Department for 15 years and has led the development of the mental health support team in 2013. Sergeant Winsky now supervises this team, which is dedicated to interacting with persons in crisis and was recognized as a law enforcement mental health learning site in 2018. In addition, Sergeant Winsky is a co-facilitator of the Pima County Regional Crisis Intervention Team Training and a mental health first aid trainer and has led the development of advancement training curriculums. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. For today's presentation, we will provide brief overviews of the CSG Justice Center and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We will then discuss the scope of the problem and current mental health resources for law enforcement. We will then walk through the PMHC framework 
and Sergeant Winsky and Sergeant Shimko will discuss how the framework is applied in their jurisdictions, followed by the Q&A session. The Council of State Governments Justice Center, we are a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership association, representing state officials in all three branches of government with policy and research expertise to develop strategies that increase public safety and strengthen communities. We have over 130 staff in our offices located across the United States in New York, DC, Austin, and Seattle. And today joining us on this webinar is a law enforcement team uh, based in New York City uh, and Washington, DC. How do we work? Well, we bring people together. We drive the criminal justice field forward with original research. We build momentum for policy change, and we provide expert assistance and technical training. Our areas of focus include corrections, courts, law enforcement, substance addiction, youth, and mental health. Founded in 1933, the Council of State Governments is our nation's only organization serving all three branches of state government. CSG is a region-based forum that fosters the exchange of insights and ideas to help state officials shape policy, public policy. This offers unparalleled regional, national, and international opportunities to network, develop leaders, collaborate, and create problem-solving partnerships. The U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance is a component of the Office of Justice Programs and helps to make American communities safer by strengthening the nation's criminal justice system, its grants, training, and technical assistance, as well as public policy development service provides states, local, and tribal governments with the cutting edge tools and best practices they need to reduce violent and drug-related crime, support law enforcement, and combat victimization. The Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, the JMHCP, supports innovative cross-system collaboration for individuals with mental illnesses or co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders who come into contact with the justice system. We know that over the past 30 years, law enforcement has become the default response to uh, mental health crises. Good. We've seen a growing number of mental health related calls for services. As illustrated here on this slide, one Florida county found that one in 10 calls for service involve a person with a severe mental illness. Madison, Wisconsin, behavioral health calls for service uh, were documented as ta taking twice as long to resolve. There is a demonstrated interest in developing police mental health collaborations, and many agencies are providing mental health training and developing specialized responses to individuals in crisis. But we know that training alone is insufficient. This represents a significant challenge. Comprehensive policies and procedures are needed to properly deploy specialized teams and support uh, improved responses to those in crisis. We know that there's inconsistent guidance on comprehensive approaches. If you look at this particular illustration, you'll see that there's a wide range of mandated uh, training across the United States, including one jurisdiction which has no standards for training. All right, there's, incon there's inconsistent standards for mental health and stabilization training that needs to be addressed. 
there's unreliable data to track progress. Portland, Maine, for example, the number of times police responded to behavioral health problems surged mainly because of the different ways of labeling those calls. Unreliable data to track progress. Limited community-based service capacity. We know that emergency department visits for mental health and substance use issues have increased exponentially over the past decade. Since 2009, the CSG Justice Center has released various publications to guide law enforcement mental health responses. Take a few minutes to discuss our Law Enforcement Mental Health Learning Sites program. It's a peer-to-peer -peer learning program supported by BJA and the CSG Justice Center. Since 2010, six learning sites have supported jurisdictions across the nation in exploring strategies and how to improve law enforcement responses to people who have mental health needs. In 2017, four additional sites were added to meet the demands from the field. A nice view across the United States of where our learning sites are located from Maine to Texas, Florida, Wisconsin, California, and everywhere in between. Madison Police Department, Sergeant Shimko, I'm going to turn it over to you if you'd like to take a few minutes to sort of talk about the uh, history or evolution of your mental health uh, training? Sure, I'd be glad to. Thank you. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Um, Madison Police Department's uh, had a longstanding relationship and uh, respect for the collaborative efforts insofar as responding to uh, mental health uh, related calls for service. Um, back in the 1980s or so, uh, our chief at the time recognized the need um, of this collaboration and assigned a, a sergeant at the time to really take the lead on that, um, uh, which involved um, outreach efforts um, to our uh, agency uh, collaborators as well as uh, taking a fine-tuned look at reports and such to see where we were. Um, seeing these calls for services and, and related mental health calls. Um, from there, in about 2004, um, there was a, a mental health liaison cadre that was initiated. Uh, patrol officers who um, were on patrol but then were uh, selected to represent their district to uh, expand that um, approach of having people have that additional level of uh, expertise and interest. Uh, flash forward to uh, 2014, um, our chief at the time saw the need of, of furthering our efforts in that area, being able to do more uh, follow-up and such. So at the time, he was able to uh, take five officers at the time, one from each district, um, out of patrol operations and make a full-time mental health officer unit. Um, that unit now is uh, full-time six officers and three clinicians, as well as one, super, uh, one sergeant and one captain. Um, and so, as you can see, we offer specialized trainings at, at each level within our own academy and then for mental health liaisons and then additional for mental health officers. Um, and then uh, we have that collaborative effort with in-house crisis workers. So it's, uh, it's pretty comprehensive and longstanding. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Appreciate uh, that information, and, and we'll, we will be asking you some more specific questions uh, in a little bit. Uh, moving along to Tucson, uh, Sergeant Winsky, I was wondering if you could take a few minutes to talk about the evolution of uh, your mental health training uh, out there at TPD. This opportunity to speak to everyone. So. Our journey for this really has been almost 20 years at this point. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, really the takeaway here is that it's taken us, um, you know, nearly uh, 20 years to get the programs in place that we've established. A lot, of, uh, a lot of support and a lot of the initiative for this 
came from our Pima County Sheriff's Department out here in Tucson, Arizona. We worked very closely with them, and they started the first mental health support team in 2013. Towards the end of 2013, my police department, the Tucson Police Department, established a mental health support team as well. And both teams are dedicated to specifically interactions with persons in crisis in two critical ways. The first is the service of mental health court orders. These might be called emergency pickup orders in the, in the location or the jurisdiction where you are. I've heard them called amendments, revocations, but basically what I'm describing is someone who's in the involuntary part of the mental health system. Both the Pima County Sheriff's Department and my Tucson Police Department, we centralize the service of those orders with mental health support teams. So instead of kind of a random patrol deputy or patrol officer going out and trying to serve those orders, it's a dedicated team of trained officers that does that. The second way we do these interactions is live out in the field, responding to calls for service and doing follow-up um, investigations. We work very closely with our behavioral health um, managed care organization, or what we call here in Arizona, ARIBA, a Regional Behavioral Health Authority, Arizona Complete Health Healthcare. They are the funder for our co-responder teams, which I'll probably talk about a little bit later in the presentation. But our co-responder teams um, feature trained clinicians that ride with our mental health support teams officers, going out and responding to crisis out in the field, and then also doing follow-up investigations. They are a critical part of our success in this area because they open up a lot of doors for us that would not traditionally be open to a law enforcement response. We also have a very robust crisis line system here in Tucson that tries to catch these calls upstream when people call 911 and try to refer um, and try and get a law enforcement response. We try to refer as many of those when it's safe to do so to behavioral health professionals. Lastly, our mental health support team is in charge of all of our in-service training for police officers. So starting in the beginning with the academy, we train in mental health first aid, and then later in an officer's career, they attend the full 40-hour crisis intervention training. And our mental health support team um, is responsible for coordinating all of that training. We also have a robust court system here, and our county attorney or prosecutor, as you would call it in some jurisdictions, is also on board with both pre-arrest and post-arrest deflection programs. And that sums up our program here in Tucson. Great, thank you very much, Sergeant. Appreciate that. And uh, just like I said to, about Madison, we'll be uh, asking uh, some further questions about uh, the great work you're doing at TPD uh, a little bit later. So what is this new approach to mental health responses? Moving it from 10 essential elements, specialized police response, and limited training, to six questions that make up the framework, the PMHC, the Police Mental Health Collaborations, and robust comprehensive training for all. The PMHC framework draws upon the experience of most advanced PMHCs in the nation. It articulates the core components of a comprehensive and robust PMHC that produce improvements in community-wide outcomes. It shifts the focus away from standalone training or small-scale program team toward agency-wide collaborative responses and metrics-driven performance management. The PMHC framework is written for law enforcement executives with the expectation that they can manage up to the elected and appointed leaders, across to the behavioral health partners involved in their community, as well as down to program level staff and all agency personnel. And the six questions for law enforcement leaders that the PMHC asks is our leadership committed? Do we have clear policies and procedures to respond to people who have mental health needs? Does our agency provide staff with quality mental health and stabilization training? Four, does the community have a full array of mental health services and supports for people who have mental health needs? 
do we collect and analyze data to measure our progress? And six, do we have a formalized process for reviewing and improving performance based upon the collection and analysis of the data? We have four key outcomes to measure a PMHC's success. One, is it going to lead to increased connections to resources? Will it reduce repeat encounters with law enforcement? Will it result in minimized arrest? And four, reduced use of force in encounters with people who have mental health needs. So let's go into a little bit more detail on some of the questions. Leadership commitment. So uh, I'm going to throw this to uh, Sergeant Winsky at Tucson. Um, could you discuss how the leadership at TPD supports um, your team? Absolutely, and I think this is perhaps one of the most important um, key points of this presentation and of, and of making one of these collaborations work. Uh, out here in Tucson, we're very lucky. Uh, we have Police Chief Chris Magnus, and he came to us from an agency in California with many, many years of experience in this area. Leadership buy-in, in our opinion, doesn't just mean funding. It means personnel, and it means really believing in the philosophy of what it is that we're trying to do. The fact of the matter is, is that when leadership buys in, the troops can see that in the training, in the messaging, in the emails, in the policies, in the procedures. I think we've seen some examples across the country where leadership has not bought into these concepts and it's made these programs at best um, struggle and sometimes fail. Uh, having, a, having a leader, having a police chief or a sheriff that believes in these issues, and Sheriff Napier out here does as well, means that that person can be a champion in the community to change the culture of how people in their community view law enforcement and, and the resources that we can offer to help. It takes a strong commitment from leadership in law enforcement, in my opinion, to dedicate the personnel to do these tasks that are so critical in the community. A lot of times what I say in presentations is our personnel on the mental health support teams, they're dedicated, not designated, which if you're listening to this webinar and you're not in law enforcement probably doesn't sound like a big difference, but in our culture it absolutely is. Dedicated personnel on our team means that they're not stuck in between um, a burglary call or a car accident, and they just do the mental health calls when they have time. What that means is they get trained up, and these are the only calls, really, that they focus on throughout the entire day. Oftentimes, we see personnel that are designated in, the, in, these, pro, in these programs and in these areas, and, and the reality is, is that oftentimes what we see in law enforcement is that that means that the person has to fulfill other roles besides just this. And we're very lucky that we have leadership out here in Tucson that recognizes that this personnel needs to be dedicated to this task. Great, thanks, Sergeant. Uh, absolutely, I mean, support from the sheriff and from the police chief um, is 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 one part of that picture as well. You know, it also takes those community partnerships. It also uh, has the identification of a project coordinator who can oversee the partnership. Uh, as well as the uh, commitment and, and dedicated funding and resource allocation for the partnership. And lastly, which I'm going to ask Sergeant Shimko out at Madison, the, the element of ongoing recognition, both internally and externally, of the initiative and the partnership. Sergeant Shimko, are there, uh, could you talk a little bit about some of uh, the recognition that uh, your unit uh, and that your agency um, you know, has received or been a part of uh, from your leadership? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's it's just a pleasure to be part of this unit. Um, not only because of uh, you know how dedicated um, our officers are, and I use that word uh, differently from how Sergeant Winsky was uh, referring to it as, but I certainly appreciate his uh, distinction between that uh, dedicated versus designated officer. Um, but with that, um, the, the people on the mental health uh, officer team um, are here because they want to be, um, they have an enormous passion and that's seen within and uh, absolutely appreciated within 
the community. Um, just a couple of examples. Um, we do a lot of training uh, for the citizens out in the community, and I regularly get a lot of positive feedback insofar as people being uh, pleasantly surprised um, and intrigued by the programming we have. And whenever we do uh, presentations, I will get um, all sorts of positive feedback uh, and, and letters of appreciation and those kind of things. Um, more significantly, last year, one of our mental health officers did get uh, our county's CIT Officer of the Year and was recognized um, at, at many levels. Um, and, and it was really uh, powerful because it was a, a person uh, with whom he uh, provided help to uh, who nominated him. And so when you get that uh, respect from families and that appreciation from uh, families and people who work in the field, it's, it's just uh, really powerful uh, to see that angle because uh, a lot of times we see the other piece. But um, insofar as the reception of uh, the individuals and family members and community members and officers as well um, within the department, um, they just understand the difference once they see the work being done and really appreciate that extra level of uh, understanding insofar as how systems work and also just being able to navigate and speak to and be the conduit of uh, facilitating really challenging uh, complex calls uh, that can really uh, be uh, hard for folks who aren't able to really focus and make those connections and, and do that additional uh, education. So. Great, thank you. Question two, policies and procedures. Comprehensive process review of an individual through the system selected PMHC response models based on assessed community need, the comprehensive, clearly written policies and procedures, information sharing agreements that are in place or in negotiation, and leaders regularly review and all personnel are aware of policies and procedures. Going back to Tucson PD, uh, Sergeant Winsky, I was wondering if you could discuss any of the information sharing agreements that uh, you have been able to get in place and uh, have you found them helpful? Yeah, for sure. And uh, once again, this, this ties in with question number one as well. A lot of the information sharing goes to leadership buy-in. And I'm not going to say we're perfect out here in Tucson. I think anyone listening to this webinar and, and anywhere I go or hear from in the country is struggling with information sharing. We're lucky to have a lot of leadership buy-in at our crisis response center here in Tucson, which some of you may be familiar with. Our crisis center takes thousands of adults and juveniles um, throughout the year, and our police department and sheriff's department take thousands of patients to the CRC, and it's our, it's, it's our strongest diversion to jail that we have in our city and our county. And the leadership of our crisis response center, as well as our um, regional behavioral health authority, Arizona Complete Healthcare, has really bought into wanting to make sure that we have information sharing agreements in place and that we're getting as much of real-time information sharing as we possibly can. Again, we still, have, we still have a ways to go in this data, but one of the things that's very important, not just to the police department and the sheriff's department, but also to our crisis center and our behavioral health authority is our high utilizers. We have a lot of information sharing around um, individuals that that touch either law enforcement or the crisis system or both repetitive multiple times. So that, that's probably one of our strongest areas where we share information is around the high utilizers, whether they're going to the jail, whether they're going to the hospital, or we're doing mobile team call-outs. And Sergeant Shimko, uh, what are some of the policies and procedures that are uh, you've been able to get in place with MPD um, in response to working with um, the mental health team? Sure. Um, insofar as our professional agreements um, with our embedded crisis workers, we have an MOU in place that's reviewed uh, annually to ensure that we're all continuing to be in agreement and uh, those uh, clinicians are uh, paid for through county funding. Um, and ultimately, uh, internally, uh, we have um, two primary uh, standard operating procedures. One is uh, mental health incidents and crises, and then another one is uh, response to persons with altered state of mind. 
Um, one is more uh, about the uh, indicators, uh, ways to identify a situation you may be encountering involving somebody uh, with an altered state of mind, and we use that uh, idea on purpose in the sense that we don't generally know what is causing the behavior, but there are certain things that our officers are, are trying to look for that would guide them to, to um, having uh, making a hypothesis insofar as what's going on. Um, and the uh, second one, the mental health crisis and incidents uh, SOP, is more related to process and uh, dispositional expectations. Um, and, and I also would uh, I also always add in that we have a separate de-escalation uh, standard operating procedure as well as one that's specific to uh, addressing people who are in, intoxicated uh, or incapacitated, and, and you can imagine that there are overlaps. And so um, we have a number of different uh, looks at and expectations for um, how officers service uh, these calls. Great. Thank you very much. The issue around quality training, training in general, is something that I'm sure many of the law enforcement officers on this call uh, have experienced. Often uh, cuts to uh, training budgets happen and agencies, once we um, have to deal with some of the mandatory trainings, uh, firearms, et cetera, it often leaves those uh, you know, valuable dollars to uh, left on the table to decide what training is going to get an, an emphasis. Uh, you know, we look at that all staff receive knowledge and skills training. We want to make sure that that training is aligned with staff roles and experience. That training is provided through multiple instructional methods, and these methods can include virtual training, uh, scenario-based site visits, uh, delivered by various instructors, law enforcement personnel, mental health personnel, as well as people with lived experience. And we want to make sure that this training is evaluated through pre and post testing. So I'm going to put this question out to both sergeants, and I'll, I'll actually I'll ask Madison to start. Uh, if you could sort of talk about or highlight some of the unique training that you're doing out there uh, and providing to your officers uh, as it relates to uh, mental health. Uh, Sergeant Shimko. Sure. Um, so we're, we're privileged to have our own um, in-house academy, which allows for uh, flexibility for us to spend um, uh, additional time on areas that we feel are, are necessary to spend that additional time on. One of those is uh, the crisis management um, as it relates specifically to people in mental health uh, crisis. Um, uh, and so. Uh, We've actually been able to increase our presence in the academy um, and are very well received and by the recruits um, as well as uh, community agency providers who we bring in to facilitate this programming with us. Uh, and it's always a coordinated effort. Um, I uh, coordinate the training and I always bring in a specialist in the field, uh, a psychiatrist to cover the nuts and bolts of uh, psychopathology, um, the basics that we want officers to know. Um, but we really stress the collaboration effort um, in the sense of officers have a challenging enough job as it is. Um, and so we really try to um, ensure that they understand that um, they're not expected to be clinicians or make any diagnoses, but it's really to be able to um, make sure that they uh, are able to identify what's going on and have some solutions for uh, the ability to intervene effectively and then partner with our, uh, our uh, collaborators to come up with a, a great disposition. Um, and so we're able to do all sorts of uh, uh, scenario-based training um, and we have uh, actors who come in and help us from the community. Um, recently, we had a couple of folks who are clinicians and um, were able to be actors. And so they're not only able to provide a, an accurate representation of what somebody might be experiencing, but also uh, provide really valuable feedback from the perspective of, of a clinician. Um, and I'll leave it there because I could go on and on. And I'm, I'm sure my, my uh, uh, counterpart has plenty to say as it relates to training. 
Yeah, please, Sergeant Winsky. Yeah, absolutely, and I will um, echo quite a bit of what um, Sergeant Shimko said. Our training really here in Arizona is a, is a continuum, starting like I mentioned earlier with the academy with mental health first aid training, but really our, our signature training um, is the 40 hour, uh, we do the Memphis model crisis intervention training, and it really hits all the points um, that you see on, on this slide. Um, you know, we follow the model, so unlike most law enforcement training, which is peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, so one officer teaching another officer, um, you, know, you know, a skill or a tool, about 85% of our CIT training is taught um, by non-law enforcement personnel. So we have judges and lawyers and psychiatrists, and we have peers, and we have clinicians, and lived experience, and our co-responders that come in and actually provide real-life feedback um, to the officers and deputies that attend our CIT training. We also evaluate um, our CIT training very pretty heavily. We do a pre-opinion survey, so we give the students um, a survey on what their thoughts and opinions are about responding to mental health calls and, and things of that nature, both before and after the training. And then also we just have them do an evaluation of the training um, as a whole. Finally, at the end of our CIT training, um, we have um, a, a scenario, reality-based training day, and most of the role players um, in that, in, in those scenarios, are, are those same um, teachers and evaluators throughout the week. So they are people with lived experience, and and the clinicians and doctors and you know court court personnel that interact with this population um, all the time. So it really is a collaboration. Um, we do a lot of training in this area, and again, I'm going to refer back to point number one. Um, and, and, what you, and what you just heard um, leading up to this question, which is it takes leadership buy-in again to dedicate the time that it takes to train personnel in this area and not just the things that we are required, right, by law to do, um, which might vary from state to state, like just firearms training and things of that nature. So once again, there's a leadership buy-in aspect to this one as well. Great, thank you. To the question of services and supports, uh, I'm going to put this once again out to both of you, uh, starting back at Madison PD. Um, what services and supports are in place in your communities uh, that can help uh, assist uh, MPD um, in responding to people that are in crisis as other alternatives um, to arrest? Yeah, I mean, the primary one I would I would point to is uh, certainly our uh, direct collaboration with Journey Mental Health, which is our uh, designated county agency who uh, ultimately decides on involuntary hospitalizations, but they do uh, a, a lot more. Um, we, we not only have the three embedded crisis workers, um, there's also an embedded crisis worker uh, with the, the Dane County Sheriff's Office. Um, they are expanding um, their hours. Um, we've had a bit of limit, limits with hours, which has been uh, a barrier at times. But there's always a, uh, somebody on the on, on the call line who can take that call, and there's always some someone on call if if someone does need to be uh, emergently detained. Um, we have developed a, a number of relationships with case managers. Uh, providers of, of all kinds, and within our AOTA system, alcohol and other drug uh, addiction services, our Dane County Human Services uh, Center, um, and it, it's just continuing to grow. And we have a lot of excellent uh, programs that help manage people who are involved in the mental health uh, system as well as the criminal justice system to help manage their uh, lives in a more healthy way that will keep them from going back to uh, being incarcerated. Um, so we really all work together quite a bit, and that's where our full-time mental health officers come in and, and be able to be a conduit and, a, and share that information when we start getting more calls for service, maybe involving somebody. Uh, one of the first things we'll ask is, who do you work with? Do you have anybody who helps you? Um, and then we'll start making those contacts 
so that maybe it won't reach that crisis level that will fully involve a, a police response or an arrest. We also work very closely with our uh, district attorney's office and, and have a, a few key point people within the district attorney's office, as well as partners in the Dane County Jail who we're able to team with um, in order to come up with best possible resolutions or even improve on a, on a disposition maybe um, and, and have it change course um, earlier on in the process. We do have warm lines. We have, uh, you know, the suicide hotlines. Um, and also a peer-run uh, phone line, um, as well as different rest respite centers. Um, I really am looking forward to hopefully at some point having a full uh, crisis diversion sort of unit um, uh, center. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can't have everything, I guess. So. I appreciate that. And uh, before I turn it over to Tucson, I have... Uh, I, I will have the pleasure of going out to um, uh, seeing uh, the good work that you're doing out at Madison uh, shortly, uh, but I did have the pleasure and privilege of going out and actually seeing the, uh, the MIST team uh, with uh, Sergeant Winsky in operation and uh, was very impressed with the response system that you have in place. Could you talk about some of the, the, uh, some of the work in, that you have with your partners in your response center, Sergeant? Yeah, absolutely. And this is becoming, um, I'll try not to get on my soapbox too much, again, just in my humble opinion from the law enforcement perspective, but this is something that's really becoming um, a kind of a national trend. Um, several years ago out here in Tucson after a tragic incident that was mental health related, um, a, a board and a committee were formed to take a look at what were our diversion options to jail what were our options for on-demand treatment? You know, what are we doing in this area? And of course, like most communities, the answer was, well, for on-demand treatment, we don't have much. So the model that we used out here in Tucson, which we are seeing um, more and more nationwide now, is we, uh, you know, the, that board went to the voters and asked for a bond election. And the bond was passed, and that's how we ended up with the crisis response center um, that we have now in Tucson. Several years later, that facility is up and running. It sees adult patients. It sees um, juvenile patients. It's open 24-7 for on-demand treatment. Depending, um, in most circumstances, um, the treatment there is free, so it's publicly um, funded. And again, that's a partnership um, through, through our uh, Regional Behavioral Health um, Authority as well. The police department and the sheriff's department out here, we take thousands of people every year to this facility, and they really have, as you see on the slide, prioritized law enforcement as, as kind of a uh, VIP customer. So one of the biggest questions I get is, you know, you know, what convinces the police officers to use this diversion facility? Well, for one, I mean, we, we, we train around it a lot during mental health first aid and CIT training. But the reality is, is that we, develop, we were able to develop a crisis response center here, um, which is run by an organization called Connections uh, Health System. And that crisis center, um, because law enforcement is, is sort of a VIP customer, we're able to get our officers and deputies usually in and out of that facility within 10 minutes. So rather than an hour, two hours, three hours um, at an emergency department in a hospital or at the jail, we have a genuine diversion opportunity. It's a big part of our learning site here in Tucson, and it's one of the most requested things that, I, that, that, that we get out here for people to come visit and tour our, our CRC. And I think the reason for that is because, you know, when, when the pendulum shifted years ago and the funding kind of went away from some of these things, we're, you know, there's a lot, there's an awful lot of communities now that are looking at, at swinging that pendulum back maybe just a little bit and trying to build some capacity in for some on-demand short-term treatment so that we can get people connected with treatment and instead of being in an emergency room um, or in the jail. Our, our connections, um, our crisis response center here is currently helping um, probably 10 or 12 communities around the country stand up similar crisis response centers um, all over the place. There are also federal grant opportunities, I, I believe, currently open um, now 
that a community can apply for, and it's like a planning grant. So you can actually get a grant that, that helps you plan to figure out how to stand up one of these facilities. But I have to be very um, frank that a lot of the work that the mental health support team um, does would not be nearly as effective if we didn't have that on-demand treatment option and we didn't have that partnership with the behavioral health community out here. So that's probably one of our, our most key um, services and supports. Great, thank you. We're getting a lot of uh, questions actually uh, on data collection and analysis. Uh, and five is sort of linked into question six. But if we look at um, question five, taking a look at the, uh, the aspect of data collection and analysis, again, I'm going to open it up to um, uh, Madison PD to start off first. You know, what are some examples of the data that you're collecting and, and what have you found uh, beneficial uh, out there at Madison PD, Sergeant Shimko? Sure. Um, well, you know, one of the first uh, data analysis pieces that we did is uh, um, in the framework, uh, the uh, PMHC framework document, um, and ultimately uh, it, we looked at, um, we were fortunate enough to have a, a big university in our area and uh, we've been um, very fortunate to have people really interested in this. Uh, research to, to look at uh, what's working and, and kind of partner with us. So in 2016, um, we did have a program evaluation done where uh, we used mental health unit data. Uh, we have officers, our mental health officers, um, document how they spend their time and also uh, associate that with certain uh, calls for service and such. And um, what we were able to find is that uh, basically, it confirmed what we thought was our involvement with uh, our being a uh, mental health officer, mental health unit interventions, um, definitely helped uh, see a decrease in uh, incidents of people uh, coming back and, and needing our services. So uh, overall, um, it, it, our data is showing uh, good results, um, and I won't go through the whole uh, document, you can look at that for more specifics. But ultimately, at this point in time, we're redoing uh, that program evaluation um, to, to see uh, if we have, you know, what, what we learn from a separate set of, uh, a separate time frame. Um, and again, it's going to be assessing how uh, mental health unit involvement affects frequency of calls for service um, and uh, what kind of uh, impact we're having. Um, and again, just anecdotally, uh, I can tell you there's a direct correlation uh, once once we get involved with many of these situations. Um, another one that we're doing is a study on emergency detentions where uh, we're looking at uh, from 2015 to 2017, it's approximately 600 cases. Uh, we're lo looking at how long medical clearance time um, is taking uh, dependent on the, the hospital. We have three main hospitals that we will do uh, medical clearances on, and that's the brunt of our time um, that's being taken up is these uh, medical clearances. Um, and so when you're taking officers off the street for an extended period of time, if there's any way that you can look at that information and uh, work with, with folks to cut down on that time, it's, it's worth it. Um, and we have uh, quarterly hospital meetings where we're in, in communication with our partners at hospitals to talk about that, these different things that come up for all of us. Um, because hospitals, I, I guess, as you can imagine, don't necessarily want folks in, in there uh, longer than they have to be either. So we're really looking at um, the call duration, medical clearance time, um, as well as any disparities uh, in terms of where people are going. Uh, based on race or ethnicity. Um, and so that particular study will be done in about a month, um, and they've been working on that for quite, quite a bit here um, uh, over, over the whole summer. Uh, another piece that we're looking at is we get a high instance of uh, response, a uh, high level of calls for service at adult family homes, and we used to be getting uh, high incidences of calls for service uh, that were generally a, more volatile um, with high-level uh, foster uh, care settings. And so we looked at uh, our calls for service data 
and, and that really helped inform conversations we had with providers uh, who were taking on um, uh, individuals with really high needs um, and really talking to them about our safety concerns, uh, the types of calls, the frequency. And when you, when you put that data in front of people and, and give them that perspective, it really helps to, to, to change the conversation um, and kind of put it in perspective insofar as what, what is a reasonable uh, police response um, when it comes to uh, going to a home over and over, um, and when, when might we just need to uh, look at the uh, setting maybe not being the most appropriate. So there's, there's a lot of ways to use it, um, and we're continuing to build on that, but uh, it's something that's very exciting, and I'm uh, very uh, fortunate to have uh, a mental health officer who's really uh, in tune with this work, as well as uh, all the help we get from the university students. Great, thank you. Uh, and out to Tucson, um, you know, one to the point of, you know, some examples of some of the, the data that you're collecting, and, you know, is, is, it, is it helping inform the work that you're doing out there? I think so, absolutely. And again, I, I preface my comments on this topic with, um, it is, whenever we do a webinar like this or, or we're at a conference, this is perhaps the number one question facing um, cities, counties, behavioral health systems, law enforcement across the country, which is the struggle to just collect and then analyze um, this data. So for us, um, we capture a lot of the same things um, that, that, you, that you hear from Madison um, as well. We spend an awful lot of time out here tracking and analyzing who's going to jail and why, why people are um, repetitively going to the jail or even the crisis system. So one of the things that we're very concerned about right now is that we're able to track people in silos. So it's very easy for us to determine, well, this person in a 90-day in period went to the jail this many times. And then in another silo, how many times did the same person go to the crisis response center? It's very hard to combine those two data streams and get an analysis to figure out how many times in the same 90-day period was a person going to both the jail and the crisis system, which we know is, is, is what's happening and we know that's what um, we're seeing out there. A lot of our programs started years ago out here in Tucson with that analysis of who is in the jail and why and how much resources are we spending to incarcerate people. When you really start drilling down and looking into that, it's a great place to start and provide some justification for the funding of a lot of these programs. We also want to know what is the average length of stay in our jail and in our crisis center. Are people staying 24 hours at the CRC? Are they staying three days or five days? And why is it that some people are staying longer than others? We also analyze an awful lot of crisis line data. We track the number of calls that are coming into our crisis line, and I should say, you know, the, the provider does of, of our crisis line. Um, what the outcome was of those calls um, for help and, and how often the same person even might be calling the crisis line um, over and over again. So right now there's a lot of data being collected and what we're looking at is, you know, is the, is the struggle right now the collection of the data? In other words, is there data that we're just not capturing at all whatsoever? Or really is the struggle the analysis, which is putting all of those data points together and I think what most places and areas are, are continuing to try and improve on just like we are is the analysis portion of collecting that data and it's something that's definitely a work in progress for us um, still to this day. Great, thank you very much uh, Sergeants, I appreciate it. Yeah, good points uh, Sergeant Winsky. I agree with you and I think to to use that as a segue into, you know, performance review, being able to use, you know, that data and, and what you've analyzed to help um, continually improve, improve the PMHC efforts. Um, you know, I was wondering if, um, and I'll start back out with uh, Madison PD, Sergeant Shimko. Um, yeah. Is there any example that you can think of that um, where you've looked at some of the data where you've actually, it's helped inform a change to what you're doing? Uh, in your unit? Well, I mean, I think one of the main ones really was uh, the hypothesis 
of uh, what what really drove us to start looking at We may have lost uh, Sergeant Shimko. Um, Tucson, can you jump in? All right. Uh, oh, Sergeant Shimko's back. Now Madison's back. Yeah, some, I, I was on mute and then I wasn't, and so I'm not sure where I was. But so the most most uh, clear example to me is the high level uh, calls for service um, when we're getting uh, from specialized homes like adult family homes or uh, foster homes that have real um, specialized needs. Um, and, and what we're seeing is it really comes down to better communication with the teams. So being able to identify, because officers really, you know, they do their best to problem solve on a wider uh, scope um, rather than just, you know, putting a Band-Aid on it, but they really, in our area, they just really don't have time to be able to do that. Um, but now that we have dedicated uh, officers and a dedicated team, we can see these reports come in and we can see these trends. And so then taking the time with our data and, uh, analysts to say, hey, can you run the call numbers for this particular address? Is, is my hypothesis correct? Um, and then when we can really see that scope, um, it, that's when it's impactful and, and being able to bring those uh, numbers and those incidences and, and take a deeper dive on particular addresses and then bring that team together, uh, the case manager, the uh, residential provider, and talk about, you know, what, what, what's going on here? What's your perception of the safety and, and adequate setting and such? Um, and then from there work together. Um, and, and also uh, the other piece that I'm really finding uh, encouraging is uh, the uh, data-driven justice uh, work group that I'm on right now. We just got done putting uh, a bunch of uh, information together from the vantage point of the jail, uh, the police department, human services, certain services that human services are providing. And we were able to uh, provide information in, in, in a monetary sense to uh, the Criminal Justice Committee uh, to, to let them know what the impact is just on uh, 11 people in an 18-month period was uh, upwards of $500,000 um, of, of resources being spent. And that wasn't even all of the resources. So that's really that, that kind of data using that is what is going to help hopefully shift um, the, the thinking in terms of let's see how we can, can do some of these things differently. Um, but it, there's just uh, endless uh, uses, and I think we're just scratching the surface. Um, and the other thing in terms of uh, the performance reviews, uh, one of the things that we collect is the information in terms of officer activity for our mental health officers. And, and that's really been illuminating to see where they're spending their time and in their efforts. Um, and it's uh, basically demonstrating that we are definitely um, making an impact in these areas, so. Great, thanks. And just back to Tucson to close out this particular section, uh, Sergeant Winsky, um, any, anything in particular that you've assessed that you've utilized for change? I would give you one quick example of something that, um, that I think is universal, but I think almost anyone listening to this webinar um, could hopefully appreciate. About six years ago, when we started this whole project with our mental health support teams out here, um, we were doing what most <clears throat> law enforcement agencies and behavioral health systems are still doing six years later um, around the country, and that is we were completely randomizing the service of mental health court orders. And again, I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, people call this uh, AOT or COT, we call it COT, court order treatment here. And we do several thousand of these pickup orders every year. And, and still to this day, and, and this is something that can be, a, in my opinion, a very good first step for a system to do and to, and to actually track some data. And that is, instead of just faxing those pickup orders all over the county or the city, and just assigning them to random officers or deputies, we centralized all those on our mental health team. That is one 
small thing that you can do because if you think about it, no matter what, whether you're w- whether you have 500 deputies that go out on a yearly basis and serve 500 orders, pickup orders, or you have three deputies that spend a year serving all 500 orders, no matter what, your agency or your department has to do that work regardless. And the problem with randomizing the service across your patrol divisions is that it's really hard to capture data. How many of these are we serving? Um, how many are expiring? How many do we not find the person? How many uses of force do we have when we're serving these involuntary pickup orders? And there's a whole just pile of data that you can start collecting when you organize and centralize the service of those pickup orders. What most places have found, just like Tucson, when you do that, is that you get repetitive pickup orders on the same person. So if you have 500 orders in a year, it's not 500 unique individuals that are getting picked up and transported to a hospital, you might have, you know, 200 people getting picked up one, two, three, four times, and that's accounting for your 500 pickup orders. There's so many possibilities just from tracking that information. Why is that person getting hospitalized over and over again? Um, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great conversation starter between law enforcement and, and the behavioral health um, treatment community. So for us, as soon as we centralized those orders, we started realizing there's so much we don't know about that population that we're picking up in the community and taking um, involuntary to hospitals or evaluating facilities. And I think that's a great place to start to, to, start to define what the need is in, in your community. Great, thank you very much, appreciate that. So just a couple of uh, updates here. Uh, again, with our uh, continued partnership with BJA, we're um, continually listening to what's happening out there in the field and, and what you need from, uh, what law enforcement needs from us in terms of resources. Uh, we've got new resource tips and strategies on sharing behavioral information. Uh, which will be appearing um, shortly. We are currently working on an online self-assessment tool that will draw upon the principles and concepts that we have just discussed in the framework uh, that will help uh, assist jurisdictions in evaluating the status of their current responses to people who have mental health needs. And a project coordinated handbook, which will uh, be appearing for uh, those of you with uh, coordinators who are overseeing these projects to help provide them with a uh, step-by-step um, guide to resources and things to implement and keep in mind as they're managing these PMHCs. And now we'd like to open this up to question and answers. Uh, we've got. Uh, some wonderful uh, questions that have been coming in, and I'll turn it over to my colleague. Hi, everyone. This is Laura Fabius, and I'm a policy analyst here at the CSG Justice Center on the law enforcement team. Um, my colleague Olivia and I have been fielding some of the questions that have been coming in. They've been some really great questions. If we did not have a chance to answer all your questions or think of questions maybe after this webinar, um, Terry's contact information will be popping up at the end of this webinar. Please feel free to reach out to him. And um, between Terry, Olivia, and I, we will get back to you with the answers to your questions or if you want to make connections to any of our learning sites, um, we will be make sure to um, get you guys connections and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you once again for joining in on this webinar. The first question that we received is, um, Sergeant Winsky, um, I will direct it towards you. What are some strategies to get leadership on board if they are not already invested? You know, I thought I might get that question. So the question is, uh, how do we get leadership on board if they're, if they're not currently? Yes. Okay. So that is a question that we get um, quite a bit. So. I, I think there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. One is trying to get your leadership just exposed to these concepts and ideas, whether it's at conferences or doing a learning sites visit. Um, one of the things that we see often here in Tucson when we do a learning site visit is I see people come in groups of three or four, 
and I can always tell if there's one person who's kind of unsure or not on board. Um, and, they're, and they're kind of just wary of all of these programs and the cost and, and what we're going to do. Um, so a learning site visit is a, is a very good way to show leadership what's going on um, in other places around um, the country. There's also a bunch of really good training conferences. I would highly recommend the National Council, NATCON conference, as well as the annual CIT um, International Conference, uh, both of which are yearly. Another way to get leadership on board is to get your advocacy community um, as gently and, and as you know, non-confrontational um, as possible. We've seen this here, um, even across Arizona, to start holding forums and start holding um, listening sessions. Um, for us in Arizona, we have a really strong NAMI, um, National Alliance on Mental Illness. They, they hold symposiums and seminars all over the state. And um, again, that's a, good, that's a good way to get your leadership exposed to this stuff. The last thing that I would say is maybe you have a city manager or a county administrator, you know, someone who isn't necessarily familiar with a lot of these concepts. And if that's what you're dealing with, go, go to the things that are costing your community money. Start analyzing your jail data. Start at analyzing your hospital, ER, ED data. Start capturing how much patrol officer or patrol deputy time is wasted sitting in an ER or um, in a booking area of a jail. Um, and, and, and start capturing um, the, the, the places where you could have efficiencies and actually save money and time if you start establishing some of these programs. Because for some people in leadership, let's face it, that might be a more effective argument um, talking about time and cost than necessarily, um, you know, the philosophical approach. Thank you, Sergeant. That was perfect. Thank you. Next question. Next question, Olivia. Oh, uh, hi. Oh, sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Olivia Randy. I'm a policy analyst, as, as Laura mentioned, on the law enforcement team. Thanks, thanks for joining, um, and thanks to our, our great panelists for all the information. Um, the next next question, um, I think, for for both Sergeant Winsky and Sergeant Jim Co. Um, do either of your your programs train uh, with law enforcement officers, dispatchers, EMTs, and mental health crisis uh, staff all at the same time in the same room, or is it and, and maybe potentially with with other personnel as well? Maybe Sergeant Jim Co. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, we've uh, been trying to build on that. Um, we have a uh, community paramedic team um, with our fire department, and we certainly uh, collaborate that with them um, on calls and, and communicate with them. And um, I've invited them to a couple of our meetings. Uh, we have uh, two full-time or full-day trainings for our mental health liaisons, and uh, we have trained with other law enforcement officers uh, countywide, but not, they have not joined us yet. Um, we are looking to collaborate that on, uh, collaborate with them on that more, um, but have not had the opportunity to do that yet. Um, as I said earlier, we do uh, regularly train with, our, uh, we include our embedded crisis workers uh, in with our training um, and uh, a number of other uh, providers. We do uh, at different times, uh, collaborate with our 911 dispatchers, but that is also a conversation we are having more frequently is how can we improve uh, that piece um, insofar as whether it's uh, deflecting a call for, for service that is able to be screened out appropriately to maybe a crisis line versus a police officer, um, and uh, how do we do those things better. Um, right now, it's more of a, we look to do that more in the future and are incorporating some of those components, but definitely see the need to do it on a more comprehensive level. Great, thanks. Um, and Sergeant Winsky, do you have anything anything to add? 
Yeah, I was just going to say my my answer is going to be very similar to that. Um, but, but the short answer is our crisis, the crisis intervention training that we do, all, all of those populations um, that were asked about in the question attend our CIT training um, all together and all in the same room. Great, thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, another question for um, both Sergeant um, Shimko and Sergeant Winsky. Um, how do you navigate HIPAA in your jurisdiction and freely share information between different agencies and entities? Well, um, we, we've really been able to navigate that pretty nicely because we have the embedded crisis workers. Our, our officers, I think, uh, are more and more comfortable with understanding the, the regulations that, that the clinicians are bound to. But because we have the uh, MOU and we have the embedded crisis worker uh, position, our, our embedded crisis workers have access to our police reports. So if, uh, if they know that certain information is already within uh, the police department, um, you know, depending on the situation, uh, that can inform what and when they can share information. So if a police officer was the one who collected that information and documented it in a report, um, that is different than um, if a clinician uh, obtained that separately. Um, and so there are a lot of nuances and there are, uh, there's a lot of trust developed um, because ultimately our embedded clinicians are the ones with the full story because no police officer is going to have access to clinical records. Um, uh, from there, when, when we're dealing with people who aren't uh, embedded within our team, um, certainly there's inconsistencies and frustrations, uh, but we really just try to encourage navigating that as uh, respectfully as we can and making sure that our officers know to do the best job that they can in collecting the information because if, if there is something that would indicate an imminent uh, danger to self or others that might uh, be a waiver of that uh, protection of, of privacy, um, then we want to make sure that the officers are sharing that so they are able to talk more freely and get more information. But regardless, uh, we really talk about even if uh, providers aren't able to share information with us, it's invaluable that we make a phone call to our uh, provider partners, specifically Journey, because they have all of the information on these types of calls, and just let them know, I had a contact with uh, such and such today, so and so, and this is what was going on. Um, do you have any suggestions? I think I'm just in, you know, informing you, uh, just as an FYI. Um, but sometimes that uh, conversation shifts gears because maybe they've been looking to, to contact this person because they've been concerned about them. And then when they're able to understand more of the picture, maybe we're able to intervene a little bit sooner. So I, I would just again, uh, one, uh, once again kind of echo that same response just in the interest of time. Our embedded uh, co-responders are a unbelievable help in that area of the information flowing and they um, are still bound by HIPAA. They don't tell us everything. They figure out if there's a public safety crisis or a danger to self or others. They figure out and help us navigate what they can tell us and what they can't and same back and forth, but they are an invaluable resource. Great. Um, so the, this next, thank you. So this next question um, is for, for you specifically, Sergeant Winsky, um, about the, the Crisis Response Center. So how are you, maybe some more specifics around how you're able to um, get officers in and out of the CRC in 10 minutes, within 10 minutes? Well, that one I can answer pretty quickly um, because it was designed that way. And see that? That's the difference. That's the level of collaboration and cooperation that I'm t that that hopefully you've been describing during this um, presentation today. All all too often, what you see across the country is, um, and and we've experienced it even here in Tucson, is people stand up programs, people stand up facilities, and then try to involve law enforcement, 
um, in the use of that facility. Um, one of the things now, and, and again, from just the law enforcement perspective, and I don't pretend to know how all of the funding mechanisms work, but we're seeing that happen even now across the country with people standing up kind of smaller satellite um, substance use disorder related clinics. And as the funding has kind of shifted towards that, you're, you, we've started to see those kind of spring up everywhere. And sometimes they happen so fast that law enforcement isn't involved in the ground level. Um, our crisis response center, again, uh, they make our program really successful. They're the bread and butter for us. Um, it, it was designed from the beginning to be accessible to law enforcement. Law enforcement has its own entrance to the facility. It has, law enforcement has an office there with all the involuntary petition paperwork um, ready to go for us. And they've prioritized the personnel within that facility to respond very quickly to law enforcement, get the information they need, and have the officer or the deputy um, back in service um, as soon as possible. But the short answer is it was designed that way before it was even built. Great, thank, thank you. you. Okay, just unfortunately due to time, with one last or more last question, um, if you have, like, once again, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to reach out to Terry. His contact information will be on the next slide, and we'll make sure Olivia, myself, or Terry will make sure to connect back with you to answer your questions or connect you um, to um, Sergeant Shimko and Sergeant um, Winsky in the meantime. So one last question, um, Sergeant. Um, Shimko, this is for you. Um, what are your office's responses to repeated calls to adult group homes? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I couldn't quite hear you. Sorry. What are your office's responses to repeated calls to adult group homes? Yeah, um, well, it, you know, I, I did, it, it's been kind of uh, something I wanted to just go back to just really briefly in terms of and I know this is a bit off the, that particular question, but I really wanted to highlight one piece in terms of the buy-in piece, um, and I apologize. But it, ultimately, I think a lot of people think this topic is uh, not related to law enforcement um, for some reason. Um, I feel like uh, when we get talking about law enforcement interaction with uh, people in mental health crisis, sometimes we have a, a, a strange uh, disconnect between the reality um, of what our purpose is. And I think it's really important to uh, highlight how dangerous some of these calls can be to our leadership and, and make sure that they understand that there, we are always going to have a piece of this response. Um, our piece should be specific and, and, and well executed, but that takes a lot of information and collaboration to be able to do our part and then confidently hand it over uh, elsewhere and also confidently um, divert it in the beginning. So I just wanted to make that point because I think sometimes when uh, people advocate for us to be uh, have a, a unit that's dedicated, they think that we're going to get more into things that aren't our specialty. But re in reality, it's we come, become specialists in understanding and collaborating so we can do more of what we're supposed to do. Um, insofar as our response to adult family homes, um, we've really learned a lot about our system. In, in Wisconsin, we went from a, a, a really well-run county system to a, a separate waiver program, um, and it really uh, took the, all of the, it just created a disjointed uh, service uh, continuum. Um, and ultimately what we found was the police were, essentially becoming, uh, understanding kind of what was going on with these individuals who were being supported in the community, we were being, uh, becoming almost case managers and convening people at the table uh, because situations were getting really dangerous. Um, and uh, we uh, educated ourselves into what the uh, state system changed to. Uh, recently, and uh, are at, we are at the table with different providers on different work groups, uh, highlighting our concerns and uh, all of the inefficiencies. And so, when our mental health officers hear a call come out, um, or uh, the officers on the street are going to these calls, they know that our team is 
uh, intimately involved uh, with these cases and that we will follow up with their, the team to, to ensure that uh, in this time of transition, uh, the people are being, uh, uh, you know, served. The, the individuals are being cared for adequately um, and, and making sure that the people who need to, to be uh, contacted are being contacted. And then also uh, determining next steps insofar as a, a, even a better crisis response um, when it comes to servicing, uh, providing services for our community's most vulnerable people. So um, that's, that's where I'll keep it just because it's uh, really a complicated situation right now in terms of our system, but it's exciting um, and we've learned a lot and it's really uh, been interesting and uh, an, un, uh, an unusual uh, thing that I didn't necessarily think we'd be doing, but I think we're doing a decent job at it. So. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sergeant. And I, I do want to acknowledge uh, our, our partnership with BJA. All of this is made possible because of um, uh, BJA, and in particular, Maria Fryer in Washington. Maria, would you like to offer some closing thoughts? Oh, great. Thanks so much, Terry. Um, I feel fortunate to be able to take it home, uh, and especially to, to thank you, CSG Justice Center, and our speaker, Sergeant Shimko, Sergeant Winsky. Um, again, you know, I just want to say thank you, and also, you know, today's discussion just it was incredible. It had a, we just provided so many resources. I learned so many new things, um, and it's specifically this presentation is designed for law enforcement leaders and middle managers um, as they problem solve and think about training and improving their responses to people with mental illness. And so, um, in, in doing so, I just want to encourage our participants um, to reach out, you know, if you have requests for materials, for resources, and for technical experts, and we're here to help. So again, thank you everyone for hanging in there through our call, uh, through our presentation rather today with all our technical um, difficulties, but a lot of great information. I think it was well worth it, and thank you again. This will conclude the webinar. If you have any questions, please uh, send them to me at uh, the email listed on the screen. And as we noted, this will, uh, is recorded and will be available to all of you uh, within the next week or two. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.